The disruption to our brain function from ever-growing layer upon layer of cumulative and chronic electromagnetic fields combined with the velocity of information that we have access to is fragmenting us continually. Impairing our ability to pay attention and to learn. In March 1978, a story in the Eugene Register Guard announced the discovery of a mysterious radio signal that had been beaming the entire town of Eugene, Oregon for several years. The article begins, a powerful radio signal that may be affecting human health has been monitored in several Eugene locations and in the air 3,000 feet above the city. The source of the radio signal is unknown. By the time the headline appeared, University of Oregon industrial hygienist Marshall Van Ert had been attempting to get public health and federal agencies involved for months, with claims that many Eugene residents were suffering a wide array of health issues, including headaches, insomnia, coordination problems, ear and throat problems, and more. According to a July 1985 article by Operation Mind Control author Walter Boart and co-author Richard Sutton, which I found in the CIA's Declassified Documents database, a middle-aged Eugene man named Walter Deposky had contacted Bannert for help after witnessing strange vibrations in his home and suffering horrible symptoms for two years. Deposky had not only suffered from insomnia and burning corneas, but he was also hearing voices. Van Ert became disturbed after he came down with the same symptoms while in Deposky's home. Van Ert himself also noticed the signal in his own home, which he described as a high-pitched, barely audible sound accompanied by a stuffiness in both ears. His symptoms included, among other things, a reddening of the skin. The sound and symptoms disappeared when he left his house. The signal itself was described as a radio frequency pulse signal, a 4.75 megahertz pulse occurring at 1,100 times per second. It had been recorded inside multiple homes in multiple locations throughout Eugene, but it was also measured at 3,000 feet above the city and extending northward toward neighboring Corvallis. The signal had been measured at power intensities as high as 500,000 watts. 10 times the level of the most powerful AM radio station licensed by the FCC at the time. Van Ert's plea in the newspaper article for public assistance was due to what he said was sluggishness on the part of government agencies to get involved in the matter. One public health official was quoted as saying that he was worried about a stampede of imaginative patients on one hand, but a potentially serious health problem being laughed off as flying saucerism on the other. Comments in the piece left the impression that everyone was kicking the can down the road because no one wanted to touch the issue of non-thermal biological effects arising from microwaves, a reality the Russians had scientifically established for decades at that point, with hundreds of studies showing everything from negative genetic effects to neurological and behavioral effects. As soon as the uh, electronic age really dawned in a, in a big way, and that really happened in, the, in World War II, when all kinds of uh, devices were being played with and radar was invented, and that was actually a, a, a game changer. But in America, such research had been dominated almost exclusively by the U.S. military, who ostensibly discounted the Russian research as scientifically unsound and upheld the same assertion they'd been spouting since the late 40s, that only microwaves which cause thermal effects were harmful or dangerous. The fact is, radiation involves something called microwaves, and there are differing views on how much radiation is bad for your health. There is no doubt among medical specialists that microwave radiation can produce medical problems. Uh, those who own uh, microwave ovens are well familiar with the cooking effect, and these are high-intensity effects. Uh, that's well established. Uh, the more controversial are the non-thermal uh, or uh, the effects of, of microwave, such as the neurological effects. Neurological meaning what? Well, effects on the nervous system, irritability, uh, sleepiness, uh, uh, memory loss, headaches, 
Yes, excellent event. Following World War II, the U.S. military set a 10 milliwatts per square centimeter microwave frequency safe exposure standard that was based solely on calculations and not on reality, a standard 1,000 times lower than the Russian standard, and one that would ensure U.S. military use of EMF could go on unabated. Dr. Robert O. Becker, author of multiple books on biology and electromagnetism, discusses at length how the military's entire system of command, control, communications, and intelligence was dependent upon the unrestricted use of all frequencies in the electromagnetic spectrum. Thus, the questionable 10 milliwatts per square centimeter safety standard was an absolute necessity. The thermal concept was extended to all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, and non-thermal bio-effects were completely excluded under a banner of denial that such effects even existed. Microwave radiation from a cell phone could use up to 2.4 billion cycles a second at less than one watt of power. And I believed, as many scientists still do today, that because the power was so weak, the fact that the signal was the same frequency meant it had no biological effect. That belief, it's a, like a religious conviction among some physicists, is in fact not correct. Once in place, the position was considered a matter of national security to defend, and the Defense Department carried out so-called scientific studies, which were dubious at best to uphold it. In the 1980s, the Air Force did this $5 million experiment. It was supposed to be the big experiment, the be-all, end-all experiment. It was funded by the Air Force to show that this microwaves are fine and not going to cause any problem. And what's interesting about it is they spent $5 million and they did it with this notobiotic rats, which is a term meaning germ and virus free. Unless you were born in a cesarean section and then kept in sterile conditions your whole life and lived in one of those plastic bubbles like Bubble Boy, you're not going to be notobiotic. So the conditions of the study right from the onset were rigged, basically, with this $5 million. In fact, that's why it cost so much, because they had to buy these fancy rats to do it, which is kind of ridiculous. And it seems to me that they set it all up with those rats in the hopes that it would show everything was fine. What it actually showed was 18 of the rats that were exposed to the microwaves ended up with cancer versus only five in the control group. And then they tried to pull that crap about how we star rats always get cancer anyway, which just begs the question of why would you do a study with rats that you know are going to get cancer anyway? This kind of makes the whole study pointless. They say that with GMOs and other stuff too. Oh, well, those rats always get cancer. Well, then why'd you do the study? So they had these fancy rats, bubble boy rats, and 18 of them got cancer anyway. And guess where the cancer was? The cancer was primarily in the adrenal glands, the thyroid, and the pituitary gland. Nowhere else. That should tell you something. In fact, I say that tells you a lot more than anything that even though they had the fancy bubble boy rats, the rats still got freaking cancer. A lot of them. But they tried to push this off in Scientific American that this is just great. Shows that non ionizing radiation has no health effects. The military industrial complex is there to ensure that the military industrial complex will continue going. And whatever they have to do to keep that happening, they will fund that and make that happen. And we are now being exposed to one million times the microwave radiation in our environment over 30 years ago. And all of the science going back 60 years that says that this is okay for you is tied to the military industrial complex and the government. Dr. Milton Zared is an expert on the health effects of microwaves who has served as a consultant to the government. The government officials don't have enough information to say that it's safe or without harmful effects. This can be found in peer review based scientific journals, but until now has not been in the public domain. All manner of tricks were used to uphold this policy. Government research funds were purposefully allocated or withheld to ensure that the only projects carried out in this area would not challenge the thermal effects only rule. Disinformation was used to create false impressions. Research to date has not demonstrated hazardous effects. 
For example, statements such as, there is no evidence for any effects of pulsed magnetic fields on humans, would have been literally true at the time, but the statement ignores the litany of such effects being found in laboratory animals, and ignores the fact that no such tests had been officially conducted on humans in the U.S. at the time. In the background, documentation on the effects of EMF was being collected and stashed away from public consumption. In just one example of many, a 1959 CIA scientific intelligence report on the Soviet space program, which was not declassified until 2008, plainly discusses the fact that data from both Russian and American studies showed that, quote, electromagnetic energy of appropriate frequency and appropriately used might cause a variety of mental effects, including obliteration of memory, stimulation of memory, and hallucinations. A document from the Joint Publications Research Service out of Arlington, Virginia, on the effects of non-ionizing electromagnetic radiation, only declassified in part in 2012, but dated 1977, the year before the Eugene Signal story broke, states that in the comparing of modulated EMF experiments with research on the action of psychopharmacological agents, quote, we can note almost complete similarity in the spectrums of their action upon emotional reactions and the states of animals. In other words, by the 1970s, they found that modulated EMF could affect people's emotional states the same way psychotropic drugs could. A scientist who did not want his identity revealed is employed by the U.S. government and has done secret RF weapon search. He believes that humans are susceptible to remote alterations of mood and awareness. Certain kinds of weak electromagnetic signals work exactly like drugs. So the promise is that anything you can do with drugs, you could do with the right electromagnetic signals. You could have a cause and effect relationship between a magnetic field and a biological function. But the people were not to know. Formal U.S. scientific establishments were mobilized against any serious challenges to the thermal effects standard and groups of manufactured experts and scientific boards were provided with ample funds to serve as expert witnesses and spokesmen against anyone with credentials raising serious questions about the bio-effects of electromagnetic energy. Any scientist who persisted in raising the issue of harmful effects of any portion of the electromagnetic spectrum was ignored, and those who couldn't be ignored were promptly ridiculed and discredited, and their research grants were withdrawn while the military continued to refer to their own scientists who insisted that biological effects of non-thermal microwave radiation were physically impossible. This continued for years, and in one sense is the exact point of one of the most important and powerful but overlooked parts of the warning President Eisenhower gave when he left office. Akin to and largely responsible for the sweeping changes in our industrial military posture has been the technological revolution during recent decades. In this revolution, research has become central. A steadily increasing share is conducted for, by, or at the direction of the federal government. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. You yeah. want me to introduce myself? Joe Joseph. And the qualifications are uh, 20 plus years as a military and civilian communication expert for, oh, let's see, Space and Naval Warfare Center, and before that, the USS Samuel B. Roberts. Lots of, lots of experience there, especially dealing with um, naval communication systems. You lived and worked on the ship? I did. So, it looks like they were picking up a signal of 4.75 megahertz at 1,100 cycles per second on the ground in this city. They were measuring it in people's homes. They also measured it at 3,000 feet above the city at power levels. And I think it was 500,000 watts, which is 10 times higher than the strongest UHF transmitters. And you have a bunch of what I presume to be professionals in here, environmental professionals and engineers, etc., debating on whether something like that could or could not have biological effects. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on that, first of all. One of the things that I used to do is a lot of radio testing, right? So any sort of new communication technology 
what I would have to do is test it. After you design it for a ship, you have to test it and make sure that everything's viable, you know? So once you, once viability happens and you field it on these ships, then you got to maintain them. And that means a lot of repair, you know? And so for 20 years or so, I was intimately involved with these radios. And towards the latter half of my time doing that, any time I keyed a radio, my joints would ache. You know, and they still do, and they still do to this day. You know, like if I have a, a handheld radio or something like that, uh, and I key it, I can feel it. So, the one thing that I did learn from my experience is that radiation, no matter what it is, if it's radio frequency, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Radiation, any radiation, the effects are cumulative. As you're continually exposed to this stuff, over time, I think the health effects become more severe. That's the only one to describe. Well, and one of the things they point out in here, too, is that it was a pulse. The concern was that the, the pulse nature of this was actually what was probably causing these issues that people were having and they were complaining of many a, a large array of various general symptoms that could be explained away here and there or something else but they specifically felt these symptoms when low level noise or the vibration was being felt in the house and if they left the house to an area that didn't have that then the symptoms collectively would disappear is that something the, the fact that they felt vibration is unbelievable i mean that's that's crazy but yeah i mean Human beings and well, all creatures operate on uh, with frequency, right? We're very sensitive to certain frequencies. It's more of like an interference of that natural frequency or a disruption of that natural frequency. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That's really like the major effect. That's the immediate major effect. But continued exposure of uh, being radiated with radio waves over time is just going to cause those long-term health effects like what I experienced with my joints. I mean, what are the odds that all of these people in Eugene who are experiencing, I mean, it's a verified signal, it's on the record, they had the people come in from the defense contractors measuring it, they had the EPA measuring it, it was verified as being there. What are the odds that people are, they're just, they have these symptoms, but it's not related to that signal being in their homes? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, yeah, less than, this is a less than zero. Interestingly, one of the people that Van Ert turned to for help in measuring the Eugene signal was a man named Clifford Schrock, a Tektronics Inc. engineer who, it is pointed out in the article, just so happened to write portions of the CIA and NSA's manuals on the use of radio equipment for debugging. Schrock also reported incurring a sudden splitting headache for no other apparent reason while he was taking his Eugene signal measurements, but he refused to admit that it could be caused by the frequency. The article ends with a few explanations of what could be causing such a strange signal, including the possibility of an errant frequency from a government military installation, although it doesn't really follow that a signal of such intensity, which would require an immense amount of power just to generate in the first place, would be beamed with such precision for so long, totally on accident. In your opinion, what what are the odds of this being accidental? That this town just zero. accident? Okay. Zero. <laughs> Below zero. I mean, if that takes an extremely large amount of power, then that suggests to me that somebody would have to know that that was happening, and there's no way that that could just be some errant coincidence. It had to be military. Had to be military because really, I mean, those—that's the only entity. It had to be a government entity. I mean, the resources just to maintain it and run it are enormous. Two things are worth noting here. First, and this will come into play later, Tektronix has taken millions in contracts with the Navy. Secondly. This article ends with a very peculiar announcement that seems totally out of place. It reads, Thank you. I found my dog Muffin. No more calls, please. It doesn't make any sense at all, considering this is on page 3A of the Sunday paper. 
It's nowhere near the classified section where one would expect to find such an announcement, and there's no other announcements of this kind tacked onto any other articles at the beginning of the newspaper like this. The Eugene signal wasn't the only mysterious radio signal being studied at the time. In the early 50s, the Soviets began beaming microwave radiation at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. The reason never was clear. The American Embassy in Moscow. For years, the Russians bombarded it with microwave radiation. Many employees there developed blood problems. American officials protested, but also insisted there was no connection between the radiation and the problem. One of the more interesting diplomatic maneuvers of recent times took place when the State Department complained about radiation being aimed at our embassy in Moscow, but at the same time said there was no connection between the Russian radiation and illness and blood abnormalities found among Americans in the embassy. In the early 1970s, it came out that a signal potentially causing biological and harmful health effects had been detected at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, and that the government had known about it since 1953 but failed to inform the American public or even the government workers stationed there. Thousands of American diplomats were exposed to these dangers during tours in Moscow, but they were never told about them. There is now a general conspiracy of silence on this subject. Kissinger and Soviet Ambassador Dobrynin recently met on this subject, but of course they too remain silent. Due to the ridiculous American safety standard, shielding wasn't even put in place until 11 years after the signal was discovered. There are built-in ironies in this Moscow scene. The workers are Russian. On American contract, they have recently been installing special anti-radiation screens at the U.S. Embassy in order to protect Americans from the possible health hazards of Soviet microwaves that have been beamed at the Embassy since at least 1959. DARPA and the CIA went ahead with Project Pandora to simulate the effects. Turned out a third of the Moscow Embassy employees developed lymphocytosis, an increase in the number of disease-fighting lymphocytes in the blood. A medical team was rushed to Moscow. It discovered that 80% of the Americans living and working there had developed an abnormally high white corpuscle blood count. Employees stationed at the Moscow Embassy complained of an increased incidence of depression, irritability, difficulty in concentrating, memory loss, eye problems, skin conditions, and ulcers. And as it turns out, three former U.S. ambassadors stationed at the Moscow Embassy during the period when it was being beamed with this signal, Charles Bolin, Llewellyn Thompson, and Walter J. Stossel, Jr., all later died of cancer. Still, as a precaution, Ambassador Walter Stessel has moved his desk away from the window to a corner of his ninth floor office. It may only be coincidence, but two of his recent predecessors, Charles Bolin and Llewellyn Thompson, both died of cancer and Stessel himself suffers from a form of pernicious anemia. The State Department commissioned a study which would compare staff and their families who were stationed at the Moscow Embassy during the period of the signal with the staff and families of other Eastern European U.S. embassies. It was all kept a deep, dark secret by the two superpowers, but then, early this year, the Russians dramatically boosted the intensity of the microwave bombardment. This alarmed the American community in Moscow, and somehow the story leaked. Only then did the State Department act. Full results of this study were never officially released to the American public, and some of Pandora's findings are still classified to this day. The Moscow signal put the American government in a bind, as the strength of the signal was only 5 microwatts per square centimeter, well below the official U.S. microwave radiation safety standard at the time. One American official expressing the hope that the Russians will ultimately stop their microwave bombardment of the embassy. David Nall, who served in Moscow until last summer. Well, one of our children who was living with us had recurrent headaches. Uh, these stopped after we left Moscow. But now that the story is out, they feel as though they have been betrayed by their own government, callously being assigned to Moscow without ever being told about the health hazards posed by Soviet microwave radiation. The Moscow signal ceased the same year that an even more powerful signal began being picked up all over the world. A powerful 10 hertz signal emanating from a giant over-the-horizon radar in Ukraine that the Soviet Union was beaming at North America. It interfered with television and radio communications all over the world, and due to the noise it made, 
It came to be known as the Woodpecker. Broadcast by a number of high-powered radio transmitters operating deep in the Soviet Union since July 4, 1976. Speculation that the signal was an attempt at causing widespread neurological or behavioral effects were officially denied. Though the official Defense Department explanation of the Woodpecker is that it is an over-the-horizon radar designed to track U.S. missile launches, some scientists suspect that the Woodpecker is designed to interfere with human brain function. As far as I'm concerned, uh, the potential that this has for producing a direct psychoactive effect upon a pro-American population is there. Has never been disproven. Dr. Robert Becker is a pioneer in the field of bioeffects of electromagnetism. Signal range within which the woodpecker operates is that which has been reported by many investigators to produce a tranquilizing effect upon animals. Interestingly, a replica of the Duga radar traced to the woodpecker is featured prominently in the Divergent film series, a set of dystopic future films with heavy themes of mind control and eugenics. A few articles repeating the basic info found in the Register Guard were printed in other newspapers. Then nothing till around April 11th when three tiny articles, all copies of the same Associated Press piece, purportedly wrapped up the case without solving it. The headlines actually made it seem as if it wasn't microwaves causing the problem, but that actually isn't what the article says. Supposedly an EPA physicist connected to a mobile radio frequency monitoring van spent three days in Eugene and concluded radio signals weren't causing people's health issues, despite the fact that they admittedly detected an unidentified radio signal which was traced back to a Navy transmitter in Dixon, California. Despite this, the physicist claimed the signal couldn't possibly cause the health problems, although why that is was never explained. It's easy enough to conclude such a finding was based on the quote-unquote science discussed earlier. The kind created to ensure non-thermal microwave radiation was never officially found to cause biological effects. Despite attributing the signal to the Navy transmitter in Dixon, apparently dubbed the Dixon Duck, Walter Boart and Richard Sutton noted that the EPA quickly held a press conference where they proclaimed the signal didn't even exist at all and then quickly returned to their Las Vegas headquarters where they refused to answer any further questions on the matter. Officially, the Navy denied any link to Dixon, and the entire investigation caved. The Eugene signal remains a mystery to this day. So what really happened in Eugene? Was it a test? And if so, what was the goal? We drove out to the Dixon facility the unidentified radio signal in Eugene had been traced back to. It was something to behold. A large field filled with dozens of spokes sticking up out of the ground, much like upside-down metal teepees everywhere. At some point after the Eugene signal ended, two Gwen Towers were also erected on the site. Interestingly, the year after the Eugene signal was detected, the Navy decommissioned the base and contracted it out. Today it is run by a defense contractor based out of Rome, New York, the same town where the government's tri-services program which helped establish the microwave safe exposure standard was also based. Unexpectedly, the housing on the abandoned transmitter base was not empty. Further research revealed that the Dixon Migrant Center was relocated to the abandoned U.S. Navy housing adjoining the radio transmitter facility on Radio Station Road back in 1984. Today, these migrants are surrounded by these radio transmitters 24-7, literally in their backyard. In the body electric, Becker briefly mentions the Eugene signal, stating that many engineers who studied it concluded it was a manifestation of the woodpecker and that it was being directed to Eugene by means of a Tesla magnifying transmitter a device designed by Nikola Tesla during his turn-of-the-century wireless experiments near Pikes Peak, which enables a radio signal to be beamed through the Earth to any desired point on the surface. He goes on to provide evidence that the woodpecker signal may have served a dual purpose, outwardly a submarine link, but with the added bonus of an experimental attack on the American people. Becker refers to the whole business as looking more and more like an undeclared electromagnetic war one that had been going on for decades, if it isn't still going on today. The disruption to our brain function from ever-growing layer upon layer of cumulative and chronic electromagnetic fields 
is fragmenting us continually. All of them have had this vibration in their homes. It was measured, it was, it was on record. They did find the actual signal itself as causing that. Um, but they still said, well, it's not in a range that causes issues, so there's nothing to see here, go home. And I just, I don't even see how that could be possible to say with a straight face or at all. Yeah, absolutely. You know, just because you can't see the wind doesn't mean that it doesn't do damage, you know? Because microwaves then were used as weapons, as they are today. It is a, a perfect stealth weapon. And when governments don't like a group of people, for instance, the, the ladies who protest at Greenham Common in England about the American missile base they camped, they were microwaved. What are some of the medical problems that could occur from chronic exposure to microwaves? There are a whole host of medical problems. Uh, first of all, uh, there's been a lot of work to show that the neurasthenic syndrome, which in our country uh, we would call the anxiety state, uh, is produced by chronic exposure to microwaves. At Environmental Protection Agency Laboratories in North Carolina, scientists have been exposing animals to microwave radiation at levels humans might ordinarily encounter. And some of the results are startling. What we've done is expose mice during their entire pregnancies to microwaves. When we examined the fetuses, we saw that there was a particular anomaly which was significant, and that was one in which the brain case has not fully closed and the brain is protruding from the skull. With animals here, it don't yet prove that there's a hazard to humans from microwaves but they suggest that there could be a problem. Uh, I certainly would not want to be exposed to any type of radiation ionizing or non-ionizing, especially when I don't understand thoroughly the effect that it has. And a good deal more research needs to be done before we know for certain whether or not there's a danger to the many people who are exposed to microwave radiation. Most people have absolutely no idea about what the true impact could be of all of the man-made electromagnetic radiation we're surrounded by these days. And that's by design. Microwaves aren't part of the visible spectrum. And as the old saying goes, out of sight, out of mind.